the Israel Hamas war seems to go down in the history of humanity as we recall all the heavy damage and its terrible impact on the normally normal lives of innocent people here. Not only that, but this event also hides scary secrets that we probably still don't know. Does Hamas fear that Jews in Israel are trying to fulfill a biblical prophecy? A story from earlier this year that went under the radar. On the 100th day of the war between Israel and Hamas, a Hamas spokesman proclaimed that Israel's aggression reached its peak with the bringing of red cows to the Holy Land. This is a reference to the red heifer prophecy, which some Christians and Jews believe will usher in the building of the third Jewish temple and the end times. So is Israel preparing to retake the Temple Mount? And was this why Hamas attacked on October 7th in the first place? Will the third temple be rebuilt? Let's find all the answers in today's video right now. You may have heard rumors about red heifers in Israel, hushed whispers of cattle kept in secret locations and clandestine sacrifices near the Temple Mount. Or perhaps you even saw the statement by Hamas a little while ago that it was these red heifers that precipitated Operation Al-Aqsa Flood. That's right. Apparently, the mere existence of some red cows in Israel triggered the October 7th massacre, according to a Hamas spokesman. The Middle East is a wild place, and this is about as mad as it gets. But when we take a closer look at the biblical origins of this whole heifer debacle, you'll see why it's all so significant significant enough to start a war. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, This is the statute of the law that the Lord has commanded. Tell the people of Israel to bring you a red heifer without defect, in which there is no blemish, and on which a yoke has never come. God's law given to the people of Israel at Mount Sinai included the requirement of perfect red heifers, no defects, no blemishes. The unyoked, flawless heifers become unkosher once hairs are spotted that are not uniformly red. They have to be perfect. What happens to these red heifers? Their fate is not good, at least from the cow's point of view. They are incinerated in complete totality, even including their dung. However, their death brings life. The ashes of the red heifer were required for proper priestly sacrifices to be made in order to make atonement for sin. Today, this passage about the red heifers is read in synagogues in the lead up to Passover, since it relates to ritual cleansing. The portion of scripture in Numbers 19 relates to this cleansing issue, as those going up to make sacrifices could only do so if they had been cleansed by water mixed with the ashes of a perfect red heifer. Ever since the temple was destroyed by the Romans, this passage is read as part of the Passover preparations. For the unclean, they shall take some ashes of the burnt sin offering, and fresh water shall be added to a vessel. Then a clean person shall take a hyssop, and dip it in the water, and sprinkle it on the tent, and on all the furnishings, and on the persons who were there, and on whoever touched the bone, or the slain, or the dead, or the grave. And the clean person shall sprinkle it on the unclean on the third day, and on the seventh day. Thus on the seventh day he shall cleanse himself, and he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water, and in the evening he shall be clean. Midrash Tanchuma also contains the statement that the red heifer in a way atones for the golden calf, meaning that the ashes of red heifers have atoning power over sin, such as the sin of idolatry. These red heifers are like a key in rabbinic thinking to the time of the Messiah. They are a sign that the Messianic age is on the way, a time in which the temple will be restored. On Thursday afternoon, September 15, 2022, at 5 p.m., five flawless red heifers arrived in Israel. They were originally spotted in Texas and were flown all the way from the USA, the Temple Institute, dedicated to the restoration of a Jewish temple, reported, A modest ceremony was held at the unloading bay of the cargo terminal at Ben Gurion Airport, where the new arrivals were greeted and speeches were made by the incredible people who have put their hearts and souls and means into making this historic day 
become a reality. That's right, they found some perfect red heifers. They are being kept under careful watch and not all in the same place. Three are in Shiloh and can be seen by the public, but others are being kept safely elsewhere. More than that, a massive altar has been prepared in an undisclosed location in order to burn any that are still perfectly red, probably at Passover or perhaps 50 days after that at Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. It's all happening. But as exciting as this may be for those dedicated to the Law of Moses, it proved nothing short of a severe provocation to Israel's enemies. A spokesman from Hamas gave this speech 100 days into the war, precipitated by the massacre of October 7th. We look back 100 days to remember the educated, the complicit, and the incapacitated among the world powers governed by the law of the jungle, reminding them of an aggression that reached its peak against our path and Al-Aqsa with the start of its actual temporal and spatial division and the bringing of red cows as an application of a detestable religious myth designed for aggression against the feelings of an entire nation in the heart of its Arab identity and the path of its prophet and ascension to heaven. Yes, these red cows have hurt the feelings of Hamas, apparently, and their presence has been interpreted as an intolerable act of aggression. It must be remembered that the entire operation on October 7th was named Al-Aqsa Flood. Like a red rag to a bull, news of the red heifers has signaled to the watching Islamic world that the Temple Mount might not be exclusively theirs forever. Concerns about the desecration of the Temple Mount Plaza and the Al-Aqsa Mosque have been the cause of multiple outbreaks of violence, and this news is as incendiary as it gets. Very few Jewish people support the idea of deliberately doing away with the Muslim places of worship on the Temple Mount, but many will cautiously assent to the belief that one day God himself will bring about the third temple on that site. How events will play out, no one is quite sure. The Temple Institute is passionate about reinstating the sacrificial system, but not keen on Jesus at all. However, we who do love Jesus can read in the New Testament that the Antichrist will set up shop in that third temple towards the end, and that this abomination will only be done away with when the Messiah comes back to Jerusalem. Let no one deceive you in any way. For that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. So now we have apocalyptic cows causing trouble left and right. Religious Jewish enthusiasts eagerly planning the third temple, furious terrorists groups resorting to extreme violence in their determination to thwart any possibility of such a thing, and misguided Christians all over the world lending their support to one side or the other and a whole library of prophetic literature in all three traditions about what happens next. It's hard to know how or when a third Jewish temple could appear on the Temple Mount, although there is enough room up there without destroying anything. Time will tell how it all pans out. One thing's for sure, the Temple Institute guys are ready and waiting, and the whole thing could be up and operational within months once permission is granted. The only thing holding them back, really, apart from a place to build, was the absence of red heifer ash. But that hurdle looks like it's going to be overcome in the very near future. The third temple will be built, but it will also be desecrated according to Scripture. However, at the end of this age, the Messiah will come and take his rightful place on the Temple Mount. 
on the throne of David. Satan knows his time is short. He is violently opposed to this plan and is railing against it with all his might. But you cannot stop the Lord Almighty. Nothing can. In the meantime, we who love the Lord need to be thinking about preparing ourselves and getting ready. What does that look like? We need to be getting rid of impurity in our lives and rededicating ourselves to Him. When we read the passage about the red heifer in context, we see that it's immediately followed by the death of Miriam and then water from the rock and Moses' sin of hitting that rock instead of speaking to it. This context gives us a clue as to what it all means for us today. Wherefore is the account of Miriam's death placed nest to the laws of the red heifer? To inform you that even as the red heifer afforded atonement by the ritual use of its ashes, so does the death of the righteous afford atonement for the living they have left behind. Even the rabbis saw that the death of the righteous provides atonement. These red heifers are symbolic of the perfect Messiah, an innocent sacrifice whose death brings life. Our unrighteousness was put upon him, and his righteousness is imparted to us when we wash ourselves in that living water, the water of purification from the ashes of sacrifice. The clues are all there. The hyssop harking back to the Passover blood on the door frames, the scarlet thread of redemption that runs through the scriptures, the perfect sacrifice without defect or flaw, the red color of blood, the death of the righteous which atones for sin, the priest made unclean, and the unclean who are made clean by virtue of their service, and the water of purification which gives life. Moses getting the water from the rock reminds us not only how much we need that living water for survival, but also that obedience to the Lord is vital. Our striving to do unsanctioned good works don't help. Just one word from him is enough. If he has declared us clean, then that is what we are. Thank him for his sacrifice that paid for your sin and just believe, he has done it. One day, maybe someday soon, we will be able to thank him face to face. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Amid a very wordy discussion of perceived Israeli aggression against Al-Quds, the Muslim name for Jerusalem, and Al-Aqsa, the black-domed mosque on Temple Mount, lies a curious and telling statement. The bringing of red cows. The red cows being referred to are the five red Angus heifers imported from Texas in September 2022 through a joint effort established between a Christian ministry, Bona Israel, and the Temple Institute in Jerusalem. All Israel News is one of the few Israeli media platforms to have covered the quite fascinating story of how these two groups beat the supposed one in, 50,000 odds of finding a qualified heifer, advertising the need to Texas ranchers, and then sending teams of rabbis from both Dallas and Israel to examine calves. Their diligence paid off as they found not only one but five blemish-free red heifers without more than two black or white hairs, even before having their ears tagged, a common practice in the livestock industry that would have disqualified them for ceremonial use. As of now, four of the heifers remain blemish-free and According to Temple Institute rabbis, they hope to carry out the ceremony before Passover 2024. Only nine heifers have been sacrificed since the time of Moses until the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 AD. The Rambam, Maimonides, stated that the 10th red heifer ceremony would bring in the Messianic age. Likewise, evangelical Christians who hold a futurist view of Bible prophecy believe a third temple will be built and subsequently desecrated by the Antichrist before the return of Messiah Yeshua. Thus, for many in the religious Jewish community, as well as many evangelicals, 
there has been a great deal of anticipation surrounding these ladies in red. Despite great interest in some spheres, the story barely made the news in Israel. It's highly unlikely that secular Israelis are aware of or interested in the presence of the heifers in Israel. Yet, the Hamas terror organization apparently followed the events closely enough to use this as a stated reason to launch the surprise invasion and attack they called the Al-Aqsa Flood on October 7th. Al-Aqsa Mosque is considered to be the third holiest site in Islam due to a mythical night journey from Mecca, as mentioned in Abu Obaidah's speech that miraculously brought Muhammad to that very location via a winged donkey-like creature. The teaching continues that Muhammad then ascended into heaven where he received instruction on Islamic prayer before returning to his home by morning. The Al-Aqsa Mosque has undergone several architectural iterations to become what we know today, but it was initially built in the early 8th century in response to this Quranic passage. While this isn't often discussed by political pundits, the site has been central to the Arab-Israeli conflict since before the foundation of the modern state of Israel. The Hamas terror attack on October 7th is the continued outworking of the teachings of their predecessors, primarily that of the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Hajj Amin al-Husseini, a founder of the Muslim Brotherhood. According to the Book of Numbers, chapter 19, the heifer ceremony results in the creation of anash and water mixture used for cleansing the nation of Israel from the ritual impurity of coming in contact with the dead. The ceremony also requires some of the blood to be sprinkled at the front of the tabernacle and in later history, the temple. The ceremony, which traditionally took place on the Mount of Olives outside the camp, is essential for all other aspects of temple worship to take place. In the event of the temple's reconstruction, its functionality for ritual sacrifices would be conditioned on the presence of the Kohanim. In addition, anyone participating in temple worship would be required to be sprinkled with the ash water. Beyond that, even without the presence of an actual architectural temple, the ceremony would allow for the general population to be ritually cleansed, thus removing much of the religious prohibition for a Jewish presence on the Temple Mount. This, of course, is a large threat to the radical Islamic worldview. If the heifer ceremony does indeed take place this Passover, we very well could experience another shift in events in the near future. While the idea and reality of the ceremony may continue to grow in anticipation for many, history indicates that it could come at a high price. Therefore, watchfulness should be tempered with this understanding and met with true intercession for Israel in the coming weeks and even after. Whether or not the Temple Institute moves forward with plans, it has become clear that the arrival of the heifers was more than an engaging human interest story involving Texas livestock and a growing friendship between Christians and Jews. It was a story of profound geopolitical and even spiritual consequence and much of the world missed it, rebuilding of the Third Temple. Those who believe Scripture contains a literal fulfillment of the biblical covenants for the Jewish people and the land of Israel are recognized rebuilding the Temple is part of this promised future. In Jeremiah's presentation of the New Covenant for Israel, we read, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth, and he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. In those days, Judah shall be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell in safety. And this is the name by which she shall be called, The Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And the Levitical priests shall never lack a man before me to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to prepare sacrifices continually. 
This passage speaks about the Messianic age when all Israel will be saved and restored to the land of Israel. At that time, a righteous descendant of David the Messiah will sit on the throne in Jerusalem and the temple will again stand complete with its Levitical priesthood. If this is to be a future reality, is there any sign of preparation for a third temple in Israel today? Since 1987, when the temple movement began preparations for the rebuilding of the third temple, efforts to see this become a reality in the 21st century have been slowly progressing. While modern Israel and a large percentage of the Jewish people throughout the diaspora are secular, Orthodox Jews do not believe these people will play a role in the rebuilding of the temple since it is a spiritual work. It is Orthodox Jews who revived the Sanhedrin, the religious body that supervised the legal issues related to the temple and who intend to see it rebuilt in a proper way. The importance to Orthodox Jews of rebuilding the temple lies in its role in the redemption of the world, which they believe can only take place once the temple is rebuilt. Gershon Salomon is director of the Temple Mount Faithful, an organization that has been trying to prepare Israeli society to accept and promote the rebuilding of the temple through demonstrations at the temple site, the construction of a cornerstone for the third temple, and the making of various temple-related utensils. Salomon has said, building the third temple is an act which must be done to complete the redemption of the people of the Bible in the land of the Bible. I cannot imagine an Israeli state or Israeli life in this country without the Temple Mount in the center of this life. However, many religious Jews do not support this idea because they have adopted a diaspora mentality and a spiritualized way of thinking, which sets aside hope in a literal fulfillment of the biblical prophecies regarding a future temple. For them, the present political situation on the Temple Mount with Muslims controlling the site is acceptable. Jewish leaders in the temple movement believe the Jewish people are not living on the spiritual level God intended because of the absence of the divine presence from the world. Rabbi Chaim Richman, director of the Temple Institute, which has produced all the ritual vessels necessary for the function of the temple and works to train priests for this future work, says there is a connection between the need for a new level of spiritual attainment and the rebuilding of the temple. The Shekinah is brought about only through the temple. In terms of our mission as a people, we cannot in any way reach our spiritual status without the temple. For Orthodox Jews committed to re-establishing the temple, both the present problems of the world and the problems faced by the Jewish people will be solved only by rebuilding. Are we any closer to the rebuilding of the temple today? The world is radically opposed to Israel's claims in Jerusalem, much less their contested ownership of the Temple Mount. On a practical level, Jews are banned by Israeli law from praying at the site, and those who visit are daily accosted by Muslims, such as the woman in black, who maintain a constant vigil on Jewish presence at the site. In addition, the Islamic authorities officially deny that a temple ever existed at the site. Nevertheless, recent developments have contributed to the temple movement's goals and the realization of the rebuilding of the temple in our lifetime. Answering the charge of denying a Jewish temple ever existed on the site. Archaeologists discovered in decades-old research that the site of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which Muslims believe was built by Abraham, was once a place for Jewish ritual preparation for entering the temple. The evidence for this came from a report filed by British archaeologist Robert Hamilton, who had documented excavations of the mosque's foundations after it was destroyed in an earthquake in 1927. He discovered beneath the floor of the mosque the remains of a Jewish mikveh. It dates to the time of the Second Temple, when Jews immersed at this site before entering the temple precincts. These findings hidden deep in the British Mandatory Archives Department because they embarrassed Muslim officials now provide evidence that the ancient temple stood on the modern Temple Mount 
and was a place of Jewish presence. Concerning the preparations for the temple service, the Sanhedrin has taken steps necessary for reinstating future temple service. One project of the group has been the planting of the biblical temple forest, which will serve the agricultural needs of the third temple. Rabbi Hillel Weiss, spokesman for the Sanhedrin, explained that the temple provided a link between the land and the divine. When people think about sacrifices, they think about animals and blood, but most were from plants grown around Israel. Rabbi Richman, also a member of the Sanhedrin, has been heading a project to restore the sacred red heifer to Israel. According to Numbers 19, the ashes of the red heifer mixed with water are a necessary element for purifying Jews to enable them to do service in the temple. During the time of the first and second temples, a span of approximately 1,000 years, only nine red heifers were used in preparing the waters used to purify Jews. According to Jewish tradition, the tenth one will be used by the Messiah. Richman and other rabbis of the Temple Institute are providing halakhic supervision and guidance in partnership with an Israeli cattleman who is an expert in the science of animal husbandry. He is utilizing the technique of implanting the frozen embryos of the Red Angus cattle which originally come from North America, into Israeli domestic cattle. A red heifer cannot be transported to Israel for use in the red heifer ceremony because the animal cannot have ever worn a yoke and must be born in the land of Israel. The project is the culmination of years of research at the Temple Institute that fuses ancient religious texts and modern science. The Sanhedrin and the Temple Movement also hold reenactments of temple ceremonies for the training of those who are from the priestly class known as Kohanim. This training involves special schooling on the duties of the priests, the use of ritual vessels created for use in the third temple, and practice on a newly constructed altar of burnt offering. This altar is unique because it was designed to be disassembled and quickly reassembled in its proper permanent location. Because the people of Israel are required to build an altar exclusively on the site of the original altar on Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount. When the time is right, it will be reassembled on the mount in the temple, enabling the sacrificial service to be resumed without delay. While the temple movement continues to prepare for the rebuilding of the temple, most understand that some political action must take place to reverse the present situation of control of the mount by Muslims in order to allow for Jewish access. This currently may be in process. Concerning the site, Israel's Supreme Court has stated in its ruling opinion on the issue of the works on the Temple Mount. The reality on the Temple Mount is by no means simple. It is extremely delicate and complicated. This is one of those cases in which a judicial ruling is not a reasonable way to decide the dispute and a decision of this kind goes beyond the boundaries of the law. It is the political echelon and not the court that must give content and meaning to the historical call. The Temple Mount is ours. In other words, this must be a political, not legal action. Those who understand Daniel's prophecy of the 70th week know that it is a future political leader the Antichrist of Revelation 13, who will one day make a deceptive covenant with the Jewish leaders, leading to the rebuilding of the Third Temple. How might this happen? One possibility was found in an academic book on the politics of the Temple Mount. Given the emphasis upon the international community's interest in the sites under the concept of the heritage of humankind, Representatives from the international community need to be included as mediators and guarantors. These would likely come from the United Nations and drawn from regional powers such as the Arab League and NATO, or interested states such as the US, the EU, and Russia. Any proposed legal regime will require interfaith cooperation composed of religious leaders from the region, 
It may be supplemented by international religious leaders who may serve as mediators. Those who seek to understand biblical prophecy know that the Antichrist will be followed by both political and religious leaders, making this kind of proposal a reality. It is exciting to see these developments unfold in the land of Israel regarding the building of a third temple as we eagerly watch for the second coming of our Messiah. Well, that's all about today's video. If you enjoy this video, please give us a like and subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching and hope to see you in the next videos. Goodbye.